uh, first a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Iowa and uh, did my undergrad at Luther College in Decorah. I uh, made my way down to uh, University of Iowa in uh, uh, Iowa City for medical school, uh, St. Louis for residency, uh, and then University of Florida Gainesville for an upper extremity fellowship, and, uh, and then back up to the Midwest to be closer to family. <clears throat> so this talk will include um, uh, products made by Exactec. I do not receive any money from Exactec. I simply use their products because I think they're best for my patients. And uh, the reasons for that will hopefully be clear uh, by the end of the talk today. So first we'll talk a little bit about the, the shoulder joint. This is an x-ray example of a healthy shoulder. You have cartilage here between the, the head of the, the um, uh, humerus and the glenoid that cushions the joint and absorbs shock during motion. Uh, it's similar to a ball and socket joint. Um, although I like to liken it you know, more to a golf ball on a golf tee. There's not a lot of inherent stability to the joint. And so we have the labrum, which is the lining around the joint that helps give it stability. Also the rotator cuff muscles. So we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, those are muscles that help provide stability to the joint and help you position your arm. Outside of that is the deltoid muscle, which also assists in that. And so when you look at the muscles, there are four of them. One in the front called the subscapularis. There's one up top, the supraspinatus, and there's two in back, the infraspinatus and teres minor. We won't test you on this. I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> now, the deltoid, like I mentioned, wants to pull the arm up. It helps you, it helps you position your arm in space. The rotator cuff keeps the, the humeral head positioned and centrally located on the glenoid. That's the golf tee, um, and it helps establish that stability to allow the deltoid to position and elevate uh, the arm. And this is what an arthritic shoulder looks like. Here you can see the, the joint space has been severely friction, um, which causes pain. <clears throat> so a little bit more about shoulder arthritis. Um, shoulder arthritis is not as common as knee or hip arthritis. It does affect about 30 or one third of people over age 60. However, we don't replace every you know, a third of people's joints over 60. There are plenty of conservative or non-operative things that we can do to address this. And I'll go through some of those. So arthritis can be present with and without an intact rotator cuff. Uh, and I'll explain that here in, in just a little bit, but on the left, you see an x-ray of primary, what we call primary um, glenohumeral or shoulder arthritis. That's where the, the, rot the um, cartilage is narrowed, but the rotator cuff muscles are still intact. On the right, you see an example of the humeral head has migrated up, and the space here for the rotator cuff is very narrow. This happens in the case where uh, there's been a tear in the rotator cuff. This is what it looks like through a scope. So sometimes we, we do procedures uh, minimally invasively to fix a rotator cuff tear or a labrum and we can see that uh, loss of joint space. Up here is more normal cartilage. Down here you can see there's been loss of the cartilage at the joint. So arthritis is pretty non-discriminatory as far as who it affects. You know, people all uh, shapes and sizes. It, the prevalence tends to increase with age, and women seem to be a little bit more susceptible than men uh, when we look at this um, in, in studies. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it's the pain that bothers them. It can also be accompanied by loss of motion, which means loss of uh, mobility and uh, independence. So, what are some of the options to treat this? Well, you know, along the conservative vein, meaning the non-operative things that we try, heat can be very effective, um, you know, direct heat. Uh, sometimes ice can also um, be helpful when there's swelling. Uh, we look at anti-inflammatory medicines. So there are some over-the-counter uh, medicines like ibuprofen. I like Aleve because you just take it twice a day. You can take two pills in the morning, two pills at night. There are some prescription versions of these that you only have to take once a day. Uh, that's like meloxicam, pyroxicam. 
Um, uh, these, all of these medicines have some side effects, um, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, so they're not always right for you. Uh, you know, it depends on your, on your individual situation. Uh, physical therapy can be helpful. Um, therapists, you know, can help you maintain your mobility. They can show you some stretching, strengthening exercises, um, and uh, certainly that is a, a viable option in the early uh, phases of the disease. <clears throat> Steroid injections, uh, I have found, uh, can be very helpful as well. They are typically temporary. Uh, occasionally, they can give up to a year's worth of relief. Uh, it's sort of variable, and I wish I had a, a, a well-functioning crystal ball to be able to predict that, but, but unfortunately I can't. Um, I, and I generally don't recommend doing more than three uh, steroid injections. We can do them every three months at the minimum, uh, and so we have to be a little bit judicious about these. But they can help buy some time to get you through a, a summer golf season, or you know if you have a wedding coming up, those sorts of things. Uh, can be useful, uh, a useful treatment. And so when these treatments no longer give you relief, uh, it may be time to consider joint replacement surgery. And the way I typically frame this to my patients is it becomes a quality of life decision. And so when, when pain or loss of motion interferes with your activities, if it's causing you a loss of independence with bathing, grooming, doing things for yourself, if it's interfering with your sleep or interfering with work, those are all very valid reasons to consider a joint replacement. And generally, when we've tried all these other non-operative things. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about what, what this involves. So um, total shoulder replacement essentially involves uh, replacing the arthritic or damaged portions of the joint with an artificial joint called a prosthesis. And so there's essentially three main components to uh, the prosthesis. There's a stem, the humeral head, and then the glenoid component. And the prosthesis that we use is determined by the status of the rotator cuff. So whether there's an intact rotator cuff, or a partially torn rotator cuff, or a, a fully torn rotator cuff, those are all important things to know before we make a choice on which implant to use. And so, in particular, once the rotator cuff is fully torn, the humeral head will migrate up. You saw that in that, that, that x-ray I showed earlier. And the reason for that is the deltoid wants to pull the arm up. When the rotator cuff isn't there on top to stabilize it centrally on that golf tee, on that pivot point, the humeral head will migrate. And then what you'll start to see is erosion of the top part of the socket. Uh, and that's where the arthritis pattern typically um, occurs uh, when the rotator cuff is, is chronically torn. And so we need to do some things to determine the rotator cuff integrity. You know, number one is physical exam in the office. Uh, you can usually get a good sense of, of you know, how strong you are by examining you but it's not 100%. So we get an MRI to look at the rotator cuff integrity. And here you can see an example of that. This is the, the humeral head. This is the socket here. The rotator cuff is uh, the top part is the supraspinatus up here. And you can see the edge of the tendon. That tendon edge belongs all the way out here normally. And so um, on this view, white is fluid. And if we see fluid extending across this area, we know there's been um, a full thickness rotator cuff tear. We can also use the MRI to look at the size or the quality of the supraspinatus, the top uh, muscle. And that gives me an idea about how repairable the tear is, you know, because sometimes in these situations before the arthritis occurs, we can talk about doing a rotator cuff repair. And that can be a reasonable solution if there isn't arthritis. Um, again, we have to look at the size of the muscle to, to determine that. But once the arthritis um, is present, um, we have to go uh, to another option. And so, <clears throat> again here, you see on the, on the left, the anatomic total shoulder is the best implant when the, when the um, rotator cuff is intact. And that involves replacing a arthritic head with a metal one, with the humeral stem, and then we use a plastic um, 
resurfacing of the joint that's attached to uh, a metal backing that the bone can grow into. Um, and, and when the rotator cuff is working, that can preserve your motion and is usually the best option. When the <clears throat> rotator cuff is not functioning, we need to link the two. And so it's sort of like a trailer hitch, we put a socket where the head was and we put a ball where the previous socket was. And so what that does is it creates a natural pivot point for the arm to move and then the deltoid up, up here on the outside can help you position your arm in space. And so that's called a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And why would you do that instead of the other one? It's all dependent on the function of the rotator cuff. So if the rotator cuff is chronically torn or, or not, not functional, then we do the reverse. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, the, if the cuff is intact, and again, we see that on physical exam, on MRI, then we can do the anatomic. So let me talk a little bit about how I do shoulder replacement. Um, <clears throat> there is a company called Exactec, and uh, they have a, a shoulder arthroplasty system uh, that uses what they call GPS. So it stands for Guided Personalized Surgery. And the reason it was developed is because every shoulder is unique. And this system allows me as a surgeon to, to personalize the shoulder replacement based on the patient's anatomy and their function. And so this gives me real-time guidance. It's essentially a computer navigation uh, system um, that allows me to use the system to perform the surgery with very, uh, a very high level of accuracy uh, and precision. <clears throat> and I'll explain a little bit how this works. So what we do is we get a CT scan uh, with some special parameters to um, assess the, the bony anatomy of the joint. The MRI, which I talked about earlier, is a special study that's better for looking at the soft tissues, the rotator cuff. This looks at the bones, and this is uh, an example of what that might look like. <clears throat> then uh, we, we load that information, the CT information, into a computer software program uh, that looks something like this. Um, and this is designed to help the surgeon understand the anatomy of the socket, understand the wear pattern of the arthritis, uh, and to plan the placement of the implants virtually. Uh, through a, a virtual uh, simulation. <clears throat> then in surgery, there is a camera uh, that has a touch screen unit with an infrared uh, sensor that, um, that interfaces with a tracker that's placed on the coracoid, which is part of the shoulder bone. And that allows me to, in real time, adjust and very precisely place the implants where I planned them uh, on the um, and so this is what what it looks like on the on the touch screen at the time of the, of the surgery we have to calibrate the anatomy with a probe um, and that uh, and then uh, here you can see this is what I would see in the in the operating room uh, we have to remove some of the bone to smooth it out and we don't want to remove a ton of bone, just enough to allow the implant to sit flush on the bone. Uh, and so this helps us know um, how the implant is inclined, where it is in 3D space, and how much bone we're removing. This is a little um, video, if we can get it to work here. Um, so what are the benefits? Well, having a 3D representation of the anatomy uh, gives us improved visibility of the shoulder joint. Uh, it gives us uh, better accuracy with placement of the implants. And ultimately, um, it, it provides better longevity of the implant and better function uh, to the patient. So 
what, what's involved with having surgery? Well, it's an overnight stay here at the hospital. Uh, we have the anesthesiologist give you a nerve catheter that involves a little um, flexible catheter that gives uh, numbing medicine into the neck. That gives you two to three days of pain relief and decreases the amount of narcotics that you need to take after surgery. You wear a sling for approximately four weeks. I let you come out of the sling to work your elbow so the elbow doesn't get stiff. You can do waist level things like typing, but you're not doing a lot of overhead or outward reaching for the first four weeks. I see in the office at 10 to 14 days to remove this, the uh, dressing. The dressing is a low profile dressing that allows you to shower. Uh, once the dressing is, comes off, we use absorbable sutures so there are no stitches to take out. Um, and you start therapy at that first visit at 10 to 14 days. Therapy involves um, four phases, essentially. In the first phase, you're in uh, the, the sling, you're doing pendulum exercises, uh, passive range of motion. What that means is that you're either, you're using your other hand to move the shoulder, you're not actively firing the muscles uh, to position the arm, uh, you're doing elbow, wrist, and hand range of motion. In phase two, you start more stretching. Um, you can you use a cane uh, laying down like you see here where your, your um, healthy arm is helping you uh, move the, the uh, operative arm. Um, we use pulley systems which are attached to like a, a door frame and you can use again your healthy arm to, um, to stretch the operative arm. Um, you're beginning to use it more. You can do a golf putt but not a golf swing uh, and no lifting. Uh, and so, and this phase generally lasts for six to 12 weeks. Everyone's a little bit different, but the protocol has criteria that allow you to advance uh, to the next phase, which is phase three, where you start strengthening. Beyond that, you start more advanced strengthening. Generally, people are back to activities that's tolerated by six months. Some people is much quicker. Uh, again, it just depends on how you progress through the, the therapy phases. Yeah. Six months, yeah, as far as getting back to activities, feeling like you're normal again. Um, you know, it is reasonable to see strength gains out to a year after surgery. Uh, and that's what I, that's pretty normal. Yeah. Down the road, are you limited in what you can lift or do when you're out? No, and that's, that's a good question. Okay. The reason for that, let me go back here. She was just asking me if there are any long-term limitations, uh, lifting restrictions for what you can do. Uh, and the answer is no. The reason for that, let me go back to this slide here. So the reason for that is that the implants have ingrowth surfaces on them. And so when you look here on the left, at the total shoulder implant, that porous metal backing uh, allows the bone to grow onto and through it. Uh, and on the stem, this is a grip blast surface that allows the, the osteocytes, the bone cells, to grow onto the stem. So this essentially becomes part of you. I don't use any cement when I do uh, these shoulder replacements. Cement functions mainly as a space occupier, like a grout, and it's brittle and can chip and fail. And so the difference here is that this basically becomes part of you, and so there are no uh, lifting restrictions afterwards. Yeah, that's a great question. question. Sure. How is the muscle attached to the replacement? When we do the surgery, the front muscle, the subscapularis, has to be cut in order to gain access to the, to the joint. And so that muscle is, is always repaired if we're able to. In some, in some scenarios where there's a really severe deformity to the socket, uh, it's not possible. And also if the, the muscle is of poor quality, it's not possible to repair it. Um, the literature has shown some you know, controversial outcomes, whether you repair it or not. It's not always necessary to repair that muscle. Uh, but I always try to, if we can, because I think that it's important for your internal rotation strength. Um, so yeah, it's, it's generally repaired uh, back. Um, 
if the rotator cuff is chronically torn, in the case of the reverse, then it's not such a big deal because the implant is essentially substituting for the function of the of the rotator cuff muscles. Does that Could make you sense? Determine that all before in the, in the CAT scan and the MRI. We generally know the status of the rotator cuff before surgery. Yes. Yep. Um, and I very rarely have to switch plans in the middle of the surgery. You know, a lot of times we'll talk about, you know, the, the primary plan is to do the, the anatomic uh, implant. If something doesn't go well in surgery, we go to the reverse. I would say very rarely do I have to do that. I usually have a very solid understanding um, before we start the surgery. I still don't understand exactly how the muscle itself is hooked to the the, the 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 lesser so the subscap you're talking about the front muscle the oh, subscap the, the the insertion point for the rotator cuff is is out here when the implant goes in it's the implant itself is farther uh, medial and so when, when we do the anatomic replacement the rotator cuff remains intact and the, the front muscle, the subscapularis, is re-repaired onto the bone, the lesser tuberosity, um, at the end of the surgery. So I generally do that through some bone tunnels and suture to help bring the front muscle back down. The top and back muscles remain intact when we do this surgery. Like I said, this surgery, for the reverse, they're already uh, deficient, and so we're not so concerned. Yeah. What about nerve damage? Mm -hmm. Nerve, yeah, so that is a very rare complication with shoulder arthroplasty. Part of the reason nerve damage can happen is that when the surgery is performed, the arm is out in this position temporarily while we're replacing the bone ends. And so that, um, you know, we always try to minimize how, how long the arm is in that position. Uh, we try to be gentle when we're, you know, positioning the arm. Uh, that does happen. Fortunately, it's very rare. Nerve damage can also happen from the nerve block uh, when, when the anesthesiologist is putting the needle in to, to numb the shoulder. Fortunately, also very rare. You know, I would, I would say these, these are less than 1% uh, you know, types of injuries. It also has to do, I think, with the person's muscle mass. And so in people without a lot of muscle, uh, they may be at a little higher risk for that. Um, that's what the literature shows. What if you have other complications, like a ligament tear or something like Um, if you're, are you speaking about like a labral tear or, or? I don't know. I, I saw, uh, uh, there was a doctor and they said it was broke. I mean, okay. not detached. I mean, it's not there. I mean, connected anymore. Yeah. It depends what you're, what you're referring to. The labrum is the lining of the joint. When we do the, um, replacement, that lining gets removed. And so with, with the arthroplasty, we don't really, we aren't so concerned about the lining of the joint and the labrum. Um, there are some other structures such as the biceps tendon. So the biceps tendon um, comes up through the front of the shoulder and attaches at the top of the uh, shoulder socket. Um, I will generally cut it and reattach it onto the humerus at the time of the surgery. That way, you know, we have to do that to gain access to the joint. That way, that portion of the muscle can still be active uh, and function. Uh, if sometimes the biceps tendon ruptures before we get to the surgery, and then generally it will scar down uh, along the upper arm. Um, and, and in that case, we leave it alone uh, because generally it doesn't cause a problem. So then will you be able yeah, you can, uh, in, the, in that scenario, it's the, the biceps tendon has two heads. One portion attaches on the coracoid, 
um, the other portion comes into the joint. And, and the biceps is really more important for doing this motion, bringing your, your palm upward. Uh, there are many other muscles that help you flex your elbow, so um, generally it's a matter of strengthening those with therapy to improve your strength. Let me see, I think I just had a couple other slides. <clears throat> So, so, you know, expectations after shoulder arthroplasty. Number one is pain relief. That's, I would say, the main reason to do the surgery. Uh, improvement in function. And so a lot of people, especially with primary uh, shoulder arthritis, are unable to externally rotate their arm. That generally improves. Now, it may not be normal. Uh, you know, 70 or 80 degrees of external rotation is what we consider normal. But for most people getting to a functional point of you know, 30 to 50 degrees uh, is acceptable. And then internal rotation, especially with the reverse implant, internal rotation is limited. Most people are able to get to their belt line. That allows to, you to do your business behind your back. You may not be able to get to the bra strap after a reverse sh uh, shoulder. Um, as far as forward elevation, with the anatomic, uh, range of motion is very good. I would expect you can change your light bulb. With the reverse, it's somewhat less than that. Now, it's very patient dependent. I have a few people with reverses who, who are rock stars. They're getting you know, 170 degrees of forward elevation. Others are more in the 130 to 140 range. That's still good. It's still better than pre-op. That allows you to get to the back of your head. That allows you to get to your mouth. Uh, and those are the, you know, the main, and allows you to get up into that cover, uh, which for a lot of folks is, is problematic before surgery. Um, and then, you know, ultimately it's qual about quality of life and return of independence. That's why we do this. <clears throat> Other questions that I can answer? Yeah. How new is the technology? So, reverse shoulder arthroplasty has been around since the 1970s. The initial design was by a French doctor named Grammont. And it didn't do well, the initial design didn't do well because of the angle between the stem and the cup. And what happened was the angle was too large and it, it predisposed the implant to loosen and cause problems. Uh, that design has been refined over the years to where now we have better quality plastics. We have a better understanding of the biomechanics of the joint. And so uh, it's been FDA approved since 2006 on the reverse. The um, GPS software, the computer navigation, has been around since 2017. Yeah. How about, um, you know, with knee and uh, hip replacements, oftentimes orthopedists will try to delay that process or procedure as long as possible because there's a chance that the, they won't, will only last so long. Yes. And with the shoulder uh, um, replacement, is there an issue with that as well? Yes. Potentially. Yeah, and, and I'm always in favor of waiting as long as possible. The, the good thing about our shoulder is that we don't walk on it. You know, and so there's not a huge amount of stress going through the shoulder, um, you know, unless you're a manual laborer or you know you're you're really using it. So um, yes, that is a concern, and um, but it's not as big of one as it is in the knee and hip. Yeah. Are you the only one that does the at OF and OFC? So I'm not the only doctor that does shoulder replacements. I am the only doctor that uses this system. Uh, and so there are other systems that exist that, that, that achieve a similar result, but, the, but none of them uh, use um, real-time computer navigation. The other systems that exist um, are centered around creating a custom jig that the surgeon uses to put on the, the, um, the socket and, and place the base plate. The problem, in my mind, the problem with those systems is that if there's a problem, 
you don't have any back bailout. You know, if there's an extra bone spur that wasn't accounted for, you know, or if the if the jig doesn't quite fit right, you're you're really out of luck and you're kind of back to square one on that. And so to me that's the real advantage of this system is that it, it allows for a real time adaptation of the plan, uh, which is I think a, a bigger issue for people with really severe deformity. Uh, and that's mostly why this was developed is for people with, with a lot of bone loss due to erosion uh, due to their arthritis. How long does it take to make an appointment with you? Um, a week or two. Um, Bobby could probably tell you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, I'm, I'm generally in the office Tuesdays and Wednesdays, some Thursdays. Yeah. Um, what kind of metal is used? So uh, the, the um, main stem is uh, stainless steel, um, and uh, so is the head. The um, back part of the glenoid is titanium uh, on the ingrowth side. Mm -hmm. No nickel or chrome? <clears throat> no chrome. Um, there, I would have to look. There may be a small amount of nickel. Um, and <clears throat> so in the knee, and we have better data on the knee and hip literature on nickel allergy. Uh, there are some people, for example, at the Mayo Clinic who would tell you that there's very little cross-reactivity with stainless implants and nickel allergy. The way to know for sure is to see a dermatologist to get skin tested. Um, and uh, I have not personally run into problems with nickel allergies with these implants. But if that's a concern, we can certainly look into it further. Yeah. The doctor that told me I need a shoulder replacement, he said right out the first two weeks are hell. That scared the heck right out of me. <laughs> so is it that bad or? Well, it's kind of hard for me to say never having yeah. had one myself. Um, <laughs> but, but I will tell you, in, in my experience, um, rotator cuff surgery tends to be more painful than shoulder replacement surgery. And and I think the reason for that is that when we do a rotator cuff repair through the small incisions, we put a lot of fluid into the shoulder, which creates a lot of swelling and pain in the shoulder. I think um, doing the catheter blocks, which gives you two to three days worth of pain control, when the pain is at its worst, uh, has been very helpful for me. Um, and it has decreased the amount of narcotic medicines that my patients have to take. Um, so um, I think that's been a, a big advancement. <coughs> So it doesn't wear out, I mean, last your lifetime? That's the idea, okay. yes. Um, now that we have better quality plastic parts, um, they are, there's less of an issue with abnormal wear. Um, but it, it can happen, you know, especially in the earlier implants in the early 2000s, in mid 2000s, uh, before the, the better plastics occurred, we, we did have to revise some of these for that issue. Um, you know, that's something we, you know, after the first year, mm -hmm. once we get you through the first year, we're surveilling with regular x-rays to make sure there's no problem. Um, once you get through that, uh, it's just yearly after that. With the guided personal surgery, though, that can be less invasive too, right? Because <clears throat> yeah. you're rather just going in there and... Well, so the, the, the incision is probably a centimeter or two longer because I need to have access to the coracoid bone to put the tracker on. So from that respect, the incision is a little bit longer. The incision heals side to side, not lengthwise. Uh, from the respect of how much dissection, how much moving the tissue to get access to the bone, it's less because I can look at the screen, I don't have to have you know, as big a visualization of the socket. So I would say it's sort of yes and no, but for what counts, yes, it is a little bit less invasive. You know, either way, I still have to cut the bone, you know, we still have to put the implant in. It's a matter of how much extra pressure on the tissues do we have to have. Yeah. When it said you can have up to three implants in one, is that 
or the zoning trust or whatever. Yeah. Um, is that in a lifetime or is that in a year? That's in a year. Okay. Um, <clears throat> once you've had three, we need to have a pretty honest discussion about what your goals are. If, if the steroid injections are lasting less than three months, then it's time to move on to something else. Um, they aren't a good long-term solution. There are some downsides to steroid injections. Um, they can cause the supporting structures to become loose. Um, when you've had multiple steroid injections and you subsequently go to uh, having an arthroplasty, they put you at a little increased risk of infection. Um, so. They're not a, they're not a cure-all. Like I said, we have to just be judicious about how we use them. Um, and so I prefer to space those out as long as possible. The other issue with steroid injections is that the more you get, the less long they tend to work. Uh, you know, the uh, fancy word for that is tachyphylaxis, which just means you know it it, it starts working less. Uh, Yeah, and so as far as rotator cuff repair goes, um, success of the repair depends on a couple factors. Number one, your age. So the younger you are, the easier it is to get a rotator cuff to heal. The size of the tear also really matters. In people with big tears, that means four to five centimeters, um, it's harder to get them to heal. There are other medical factors that impact it, like diabetes, smoking, thyroid problems, that sort of thing. Um, and, then, and then I would say the most important thing is the quality of the muscle that you're trying to repair. If on the MRI, the muscle has shrunk to less than 50% of its normal cross-sectional diameter, then you know, the chances of, of that working once we, once we hook it back up are pretty small. So the MRI is really important to help make that decision. Um, and, uh, and it's also about your, your tolerance for having potentially multiple surgeries, right? Because if we do a rotator cuff repair and it doesn't work, we have to go on and do uh, you know, the replacement later. And that's a lot of recovery time. So you know, there are multiple factors that influence that discussion um, and, and you know, no two patients are the same. So it's important to put all that together um, and then you know, sort of lay out the risks and benefits. And uh, that's where I kind of view my job is to present you the information. You know, this is what you can expect. This is what's involved with each option. And then we choose what's best for you in your situation. Yeah. When you have to use your other arm to raise it up, is that rotator cuff? Generally, yeah, it's either, it's either weakness, you know, or if that rotator cuff isn't hooked up, you know, that can cause weakness, can cause pain. Uh, that's, that's not a good sign. But, you know, there's other things that, in, that go into it too, but, yeah. Yeah. I had a rotator cuff repair in 1996. Mm -hmm. It has since worn out. Okay. Yeah. Very seriously looking at this. So, any any concerns with rejection on these implants, uh, that is, or is that pretty much a thing of the past? Yeah, not not really. No, in the in the old days when we had the, the early implant designs, created a lot of plastic debris, and that debris could cause what we call osteolysis, meaning the bone would would be inflamed from this plastic debris, um, and it could cause the implants to loosen. Um, so that's not as big of a concern now. It does still happen. Um, one of the bigger threats to the implant is infection. And so we take a lot of, we take ultra precautions to make sure we don't get an infection at the time of surgery. We wear special hoods. We're in an OR with, with special laminar flow. Um, you know, we give you the antibiotics. 
I put powdered antibiotics in the wound, um, and we, we take a lot of care with the handling of the soft tissues to help prevent infection, because it's a disaster. But I'm sure each individual patient's health plays into the, how it works out, too. Absolutely, yeah, it, it definitely does, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's something that I always talk about beforehand, you know, these are the risks. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, bleeding, infection, damage to surrounding structures, uh, dislocation is a bigger risk in the early phases. That's why you're in the sling, or the sling for, for four weeks. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, can you need both of them replaced? Can be done. Uh, I've certainly uh, done it. Um, and that's not an issue. Obviously, we don't do them at the same time. Um, you know, I prefer to do whichever one bothers you the worst first and get you through that recovery and then we can do the other one. Um, but uh, yes, it can certainly be done. Another thing, when can you start driving after that? So I let you drive, number one, once you're off the narcotic medicines. Um, and, and I leave it up to you to decide when you feel safe controlling the wheel of a car. Um, you know, if you get in an accident and you're in a sling and the state trooper asks you what your doctor said, the answer is you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be driving, you know, but, but I, I, I leave that decision up to you, um, and just use your common sense about that and, and drive safely. Yeah, if you're driving a school bus, for sure, not until you're out of the sling. That would that would be a hard, a hard no. Okay, but that might be just weeks. Then? Generally, it's four weeks. Yeah, it's four weeks that you're in the sling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a that's definitely a consideration. Yeah, uh, that is possible if the rotator cuff is still attached. Obviously, if you've had a chronic tear of the rotator cuff, there's really no amount of strengthening that's going to improve it. You know, you can strengthen the deltoid, which is the outside muscle, and um, that can have a big impact on your recovery afterward. Um, but generally, when people get to the point of deciding they want shoulder replacement surgery, you know, they don't want to wait six or eight weeks to do therapy, um, you know, because you're definitely going to be doing it afterward. So um, I see that more commonly, you know, but certainly if you wanted to look at, you know, we call it prehab, uh, you know, pre-rehabilitation, uh, that's, that's possible. Also, we run, sometimes we run into problems with how much insurance will cover. You know, sometimes they only give you 20 or 24 visits or whatever. You know, so that's another consideration to, to make is you don't want to use them all up before surgery. Dr. McNamara, do you yeah. want me to try to pull the video up that you had on your slide? If it's possible, yeah. I, I thought it added some <coughs> to the kind of other side. Well, 
it was um, it was on that that uh, website that you logged into. There are, you're right. Yeah, there are. We can, we can look at it. If you go to gap providers and then just under, I think I'm close to the bottom. Uh, that might, let's, yeah, try that. Guided personalized surgery with ExactTech GPS is the latest advancement in technology that provides surgeons with real-time visual guidance in total shoulder replacement surgery. This advanced platform combines surgery perform your shoulder surgery with a goal of advanced accuracy and precision, personalized to your unique anatomy. Prior to the operation, your surgeon will use a pre-operative planning tool to plan your surgery through a virtual simulation. Your surgeon can then execute the plan in real time during the surgery based on a 3D anatomical model of your shoulder, making adjustments as needed. With a tracker placed on the patient's bone, the system sends data on each patient's anatomical structure and joint movement to the computer. This active tracker technology works together with an infrared camera to monitor the position and alignment of the joint replacement. The computer analyzes the data alongside the 3D model of your bone with calculated key measurements. The surgeon can see important parts of the shoulder anatomy on the display screen that are normally difficult to view during surgery. With this comprehensive visual, your surgeon can verify precisely where to remove damaged bone and place the implant. Personalized for your unique bone structure and anatomy, ExactTech GPS gives greater visibility to the shoulder anatomy, allowing for more accurate implant placement. It's on our OFC website. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. But not on River's Edge. Not yet. We'll no. Can, we yeah, could we maybe can work on that, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we just recently added that, so I wasn't aware. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How long have you been at the clinic? I've been here since 2018. So I took over for um, Dr. Harrington and Dr. Carney, who both retired in that year. And prior to that, I was in my fellowship uh, in uh, Gainesville. So do you just do shoulders? Or do you... I do shoulder, elbow, wrist, fingers, everything from here to here. I tell people, you don't want your plumber replacing your roof. I <laughs> stick to what I'm good at. So <laughs> I don't do knees or hips. Yeah. Do people ever golf again? Yes. Especially after the anatomic total shoulder, that's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. What about, what, is that the reverse one? The, um, the one where, where it's when the um, joint is in the normal relationship, that's called anatomic. Okay. Reverse is when we flip it. Like I was saying, for, for a lot of people, the motion is slightly decreased after the reverse compared to the normal, it's increased compared to the preoperative status. Does that make sense? And so um, with, with the anatomic, the motion is generally better. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I'll stick around a little more. If you guys have other uh, individual questions you want me to answer, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you.